God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. We are Abundant Grace Church. I am Bishop Ramon Di Maria, and I am the pastor of Abundant Grace Church. Truly, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall all rejoice and be glad in it. Today, my message title will be, In Christ, Failure is Never an Option. And this will be part one. Our scripture today will be Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. Firstly, from the King James Version, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now the Bible in basic English renders it, For me, life is Christ, and death is profit. The author of this epistle is the Apostle Paul. He wrote it approximately A.D. 62 from Rome while he was in prison. The theme of his letter is the guide for ordinary Christian living with joy and rejoicing. Paul also assures them that God will reward them for their generosity. A chapter one outline is Paul begins Philippians chapter one by thanking God for the people to whom he is writing. His prayer centers on the notion that there is a partnership between the followers of God and Christ. Paul says there is a covenant that would be made to carry on the good work of Jesus Christ in his name. Now our chapter segment theme is to live is Christ. Praise God. Our opening verse will be from Philippians chapter 1 and verse 18 which reads as follows from the King James Version, What then? Notwithstanding, every way, either in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. The Bible in basic English renders it, What then? Only that in every way, falsely or truly, the preaching of Christ goes on, and in this I am glad, and will be glad. So my beloved, to understand the point of Paul in this verse, we must revert back to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 17, which reads, But those are preaching Christ in a spirit of competition, not from their hearts, but with the purpose of giving me pain in my prison. Where he was in prison, he was hearing about these false preachers. Now, let me put it this way. They were changing the gospel to suit them and the following that they had, which means that they wanted the people to look at them, and they wanted to be popular above Jesus Christ, or they wanted the people to take notice of them and set aside the truth that the Apostle Paul was preaching, okay? So, let's comment on Philippians chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, what then? What he is actually saying is, what follows from this? What effect does it have on my mind? Does the fact that some preach from a spirit of envy and contention give me pain? So he's presenting this in a form of a question. And Paul is going to answer that himself. Because he says, whether in pretense or in truth. 
whether as a mere pretext to cover up some other design or from pure motives, their pretense was that they preached the gospel because they believed it true and loved it. Their real object was to build up a party. See, Paul preached to honor Jesus Christ, but others did it to build up a following, to build up a congregation, those that would follow them and look to them for everything instead of looking to God through Jesus Christ. And he also wanted to diminish Paul's influence on the people. And also, one important part, they wanted to diminish Paul's authority in the gospel. Many times Paul says, I got this from Jesus Christ himself. And I preach with the authority of Christ, which means he stands in the steed of Christ, preaching truth from the pulpit or from wherever he was at. Whether it was in a crowd, whether it was in a temple or synagogue, he was always preaching the truth of Christ and giving Christ the praise and the glory. So he says, in all of this, Christ is preached. They made known the name of the Savior and announced that the Messiah had come. They could not go forth under any pretense as preachers without making known some truth about the Redeemer. So no matter what they were saying, they had to preach Christ. They had to mention the name of Jesus Christ. And just the mention of Christ is power and healing and newness of life, which is salvation, which is eternal life in heaven instead of hell. So now it is hardly possible that any person should attempt to preach without stating some truth that would not otherwise be known. So if they want to preach Christ, then they have to preach certain aspects of the life and redemption of Jesus Christ. If they try to say something against what Paul preached, they still had to mention Christ. So no matter what, Christ was being preached in all things. So the name of the Savior will be announced, and that will be something. If they are saying that we're preaching more truth than the Apostle Paul about Christ, then you're, they're mentioning Christ and mentioning the words of Christ. Now, some preachers will say that Christ really meant this or really meant that. But no matter what, Christ is being preached. And then when people open up the Word of God, and read it, the Holy Spirit will reveal truth to them. Okay? All preachers do is stimulate the thought process of someone. Then it is up to the individual or that someone to seek the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit appears in their thoughts and directs them to where they should go to find out the truth through the Word of God. And then he opens up the Word in truth. So the announcement of that fact in any way may save someone who was lost. But the ignorance of it can save no one. You get saved by hearing. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Okay? So whether they were preaching pure truth or not, they were hearing the Word of God. Okay? Paul says, and I therein do rejoice. This is an instance of great magnitude on the part 
of the Apostle Paul. And nothing, perhaps, could be better than to show the supreme love of Jesus Christ. Because they had to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So, but the more important matter was secured and Christ was made known. And if this were secured, he was willing that his own name should be cast into the shade. So Paul says, I don't want to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't preach anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, and this may furnish valuable lessons to preachers of the gospel right now. Preachers are to preach the truth, but when they don't, just the name of Jesus Christ is power. And then the Holy Spirit takes the word and he reveals it to those that have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Okay? So know that the truth will be preached. And it will be preached or it will be let me put it, uh, verified by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit reveals truth and untruth. So the Holy Spirit will bring out the truth of the Word of God in Christ Jesus. Let me make four important points. One. When we are laid aside from preaching by sickness, we should rejoice that others are in health and are able to make the Savior Jesus Christ known, though we are forgotten. My beloved, when I leave this life, while well, I am unable to preach anymore, my messages are on CD, on tape, on video, on social media. When it's time for me to decrease, the Word of God will continue to go on because I believe that through the Word that I preach, others hear it and can build on that Word because others are being saved through the Word of God that I preach in truth. And not just me. The preaching of any other preacher that preaches the truth and those that receive it, they will continue on with the gospel. Paul had Timothy and he had Luke to carry on. And I have many people to carry on this ministry which exalts Jesus Christ 100%. Two, when we are unpopular and unsuccessful, we should rejoice that others are more popular and successful. For Jesus Christ is preached. The size of a ministry means nothing. Because you can have a big ministry and not preach the truth. You can have a small ministry and preach the truth. No matter what, the word of God goes out and it will not return void. We have a small ministry, but the word of God goes out in truth. And many are saved and set free from the bondage of Satan. So I give God, through Jesus Christ, all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for this ministry and its outreach to the world. Three, when we have rivals in the ministry, who have better plans than we for doing good, and whose labors are crowned with success. We should not be envious or jealous, for Jesus Christ is preached. I don't care how big somebody's church is. Matter of fact, I'm glad our church is this size, because I can dedicate time to the ministry. I have more time to dedicate. I can use the resources 
where if I had a big congregation of 200 to 400 members, I would be taxed on my time. So praise God for others that have a big staff, have bigger churches where they can minister in more ways than me. I praise God for them. I am not envious of them. But I praise God for using them. Hallelujah. Four. When ministers of other denominations preach what we regard as error and their preaching becomes popular and is attended with success, we can find occasion to rejoice for they preach Jesus Christ. You cannot have a congregation without preaching Jesus Christ. Whether you preach an error or not, you're still preaching Jesus Christ. And as I said a few minutes back, the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals truth. And he will make the correction. And he will make the correction in those that don't preach the truth. He will convict them. And may I also add, he will remove them. Because God is in control. Sometimes you see churches just dwindle and shut down. Why? Something was wrong. And it's not for me to challenge them. The Word of God challenges them. The Word of God reads them. The Word of God corrects them. The Word of God chastises them. Me, I speak the truth. And if the occasion arises where I can speak to other preachers and make a correction in love, I will do it. But only in love. Philippians chapter 1, and verse 19 reads, from the King James Version, For I know that this small turn to my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul's preaching of the truth and his love for everyone will turn out for the betterment of him in salvation. The Bible in basic English renders it, for I am conscious that this will be for my salvation through your prayer and the giving out of the stored wealth of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul received crowns for his work. And I pray that I receive crowns for my work in the gospel. And when I come before Christ, I stand before Christ, I want the opportunity to cast the, my crowns at the feet of of my Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Because I don't deserve any crowns. He deserves them for what he did for me on Calvary. For how he brought me through. For how he opened doors for me. For how he closed doors for me. How he healed me. Gave me eternal life. And took me through this life in his service. He talks about, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. It means it will be a means of his salvation. Whether the effect shall turn public favor toward the Christian religion and secure his release, or whether it shall be to instigate by his enemies, which means that they turn against him for preaching the truth. So, and even so as to lead to his death. Remember, Paul went to Rome. He was in prison because he was awaiting trial by Nero. And he stood before Nero. And we know the ultimate end of Paul was that he was beheaded for his faith in Jesus Christ. He was offered on the altar of praise for Jesus Christ. So, 
He is satisfied no matter what the result is. Because he knows that whatever the result is, it will be to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ, of which Paul was a servant. Through your prayer, it talks about knowing that the genuine followers of Christ, those at Philippi, were praying for him. And they were sending offerings to him. Because, you know, Paul had to buy candles, ink, and parchments so he could continue to write the letters to the churches on behalf of Jesus Christ. So, Paul depended on Christ. And Christ touched the hearts of the Philippians to give so he could continue his work for the gospel. It talks about the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The word supply signifies furnishing what is necessary in simple terms. That the Holy Spirit worked on the spirits of the Philippians and many others to supply Paul's need in prayer and in the materialistic things that he needed to continue the ministry until he left this life okay and I know that God will continue to meet our need for this church he will continue to meet my need and he will continue to meet the need of those that take over after I leave so praise God for that blessing that I have peace about knowing that the ministry will continue on. So let me ask you a question today. Have you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you received Christ as your Savior and Lord? If not, I want to give you the opportunity today. It's not hard. You must acknowledge you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, died, buried, and rose from the dead on the third day. And that he ascended into heaven and is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father. If you would like to do that today, then I want to lead you into prayer. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, I come to you a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all mankind, that he was crucified, died, buried, rose from the dead on the third day, and ascended into heaven, and is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father, from where he shall come to judge the dead and the living. I believe that today. I accept that as truth today. Save me. Save me from the pains of hell, that when I leave this life, I may be with you in heaven forever. And I believe that through my repentance and my confession of faith in Jesus Christ that I have received Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And when I depart from this life, I will be with him and all the other saints that have went before me in heaven for eternity. Thank you for saving me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My beloved, if you said that prayer and meant it from your heart, let me be the first to welcome you into the kingdom of God. And what I want you to do is go to a Bible preaching, teaching church, get an audience with a pastor, tell him what happened, ask him to anoint you with oil, to pray with you, to pray for you, and to baptize you by full immersion in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ask him to mentor you and to give you a Bible if you have one. Then what I would like you to do is email me and tell me what happened. My email address is abundant.grace at att.net or you can visit our website at www.abundantgracechurch.net 
or our other website, AbundantGraceOfMedlothian.com. Or you can just Google my name, Bishop Ramon Di Maria, or Abundant Grace Church, and our ministries will come up, videos and everything else. Because I know if you're watching this, you're watching it through social media on one of our outlets. So thank you for being with us today. Our message has been part one of In Christ, Failure is Never an Option. Next week, we will continue with part two. God bless you, my beloved, and go with God. And please let me hear from you.